If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for Podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. Hey everyone, this is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And And this this is is Unforgotten. Unforgotten. Where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. Be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel for early access to unforgotten episodes and bonus content. Your subscription will help support the efforts of ACCA in assisting families in raising awareness for Alabama cold cases. Hey, everybody, and welcome back. Hey, Stormy. What do you call a fake noodle? A fake noodle? Yeah. I don't know. What do you call a fake noodle? An impasta. Oh, I love that one. That's my I love pasta. Me <laughs> so too. I'm gonna I'm gonna hang on to that one in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So just a couple of reminders. Um we have a new website, alcoldcase.com. It is still a work in progress. Um we are working on getting all of the cases that we have posted on the page put up on their own actual page on the website. And you'll be able to go through based on the county and pull up the cases in their own county. It'll be, make it a little bit more organized. We're working on having a page for the podcast and a blog where we'll be able to write articles about things that have come out and updates, things that are going on, kind of like what we did with the timeline for the Anthony Mitchell case. Um, and all around, it, I think it's going to be really helpful. It's going to help us, you know, keep up with things a little bit. It's going to be a little bit more organized. And we're trying to include links to go to the case visualizations on Uncovered and also be able to link you to the investigating agencies so that you'll be able to submit tips straight from the case page on the website. That's like my favorite thing so far that we've decided to do. I love that. I'm really excited about that part. So, Sellers, have you heard that there's a new podcast out called Why Can't We Talk About Amanda's Mom? I have been waiting. I did not know that's what it was called, but I've been waiting for this to come out because I keep seeing where Sarah Kayleen has been writing about it, um, tweeting about it, and Mm. I'm super excited about listening to it. It's going to discuss the November 1993 murder of Renee Bergeron in Mobile County that has been unsolved since that time. Um, And Sarah's been investigating it. And Mobile County Sheriff's Office actually, I think, gave her permission to do this and supported her throughout making the podcast. And Renee's daughter actually participated, too. I think it's going to be really good. And I hope that it, you know serves its purpose and gets some information coming in. Yeah, that would be awesome. And Sarah Kayleen's done some really great things. So I'm sure this is going to be a wonderful um, podcast. I agree. I agree. Last week, we were in Covington County in South Central Alabama. This week, we're discussing two cases from North Central Alabama and Coleman County. It sits in the middle of Blunt, 
Morgan, Winston, and Walker counties. Its population in 2021 was just a bit shy of 88,000 people. It's known for the Ave Maria Grotto at St. Bernard Abbey in the city of Coleman. It's known for its 125 reproductions um, of famous religious sites, such as the Lord's Basilica in France, which is pretty cool, I thought. That is pretty cool. If you ever get a chance, you could go look at it. It's kind of cool. They have like, well, whatever, what did I say, 125? They're, they're about like person height, maybe a little smaller. Well, that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, there's 125 of them out there. It's pretty, I mean, I suppose some of them we probably know and just never, I, you know, wouldn't know. the time them. to do that? Well, it was, uh, like, um, I think it used to be a monastery for monks only, and then it shut down. But the guy that, like, made it or something, um, he eventually, like, well, he did all these, but then, or he commissioned them or something. But I guess you got a lot of time on your hands when you're a monk. And, yeah. <laughs> that's funny <laughs> you do i mean you know they they have to contemplate i exactly. guess maybe they had a special anyway meditation uh, yeah and coleman is also and this is one that i suppose all yeah i'm i'm gonna be stereotypical here but a lot of women will like this one <laughs> coleman is also the hometown of actor channing tatum you know what my favorite movie of his is what? Step up. Really? Yeah. Oh. I don't think I've actually seen it. I've seen, you know, like previews for it, but I've never actually seen it's it. It's really good. And I really like the new one, Lost City, Lost City with Sandra Bullock. Oh, yeah. So our first case, 47-year-old David Michael Burney lived in Vinemont, Alabama. On June 29th, 2007, he had purchased a new, to him, car a red 87 Toyota Tercel. He had made plans that day to go to visit his two daughters in Georgia. As he apparently was getting ready for his car ride, he stopped on his way at a gas station slash convenience store called Jet Pep, located on Highway 157 in Battleground, Alabama. I have never heard of a Jet Pep. We don't have them where I am. I had never and heard so of it I, either before now. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just me. Nope, not okay. just you. This was actually the last sighting of David. Uh, this is going to be one of those cases that we unfortunately are not able to find a lot of information on, um, which is sad to me. You know, this is kind of one of those things that we talk about, again, a lot. Um lack of information on some of the cases and we aren't sure all the time why i always hate trying to fill out our case summary cards and not having very much information because mm. we have some that we can fill the whole thing up and then there's others where it just doesn't even take up maybe a third of the page right yep so two months after he had stopped at the jet pep his Toyota was found abandoned in the Bankhead Forest of County Road 15 in Winston County. And I am going to preface this. It actually said County Road B15, but when I was looking at the map, um, I couldn't find any uh, county roads called B15. So I'm assuming they're the same thing. And um, if anybody out there knows the difference and got, I'm wrong about that, please let us know. I want to make sure we get the facts straight. Um, I wonder if B15 is something similar to like a um, fire lane or something like that, where it's like a county road, but it's more like a service road type could thing. Be, so yeah. instead of renaming it, they just put a letter with it. It could be. Yeah, very well could be. So where they found his car, it was out of gas and the battery was missing. And it would seem, I would think, at this point, safe to assume that probably there was foul play, given how far away from the jet pep the car was found. Um, his mother, or sister, and six children, all of them said that he wouldn't have left on his own. They did say he had some enemies and that they may have wanted to harm him, possibly. So foul how play. far away was the car from the gas station? Mm -hmm. 
I can't remember the number of miles, but when I do remember, it was about an hour and a half drive. Oh, that is pretty um, It was all the way on the other side of Winston County. So he had to cross the full county of Winston to, I mean, the car had to cross the full county of Winston. How um, close was so it? So basically on the west side of the forest How area. close was it to the Georgia line? I don't have a to map. The, the Georgia. He was headed to Georgia. Um, right? It's actually the opposite direction. Holy crap. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Ew. So I'm guessing that he went north. Um, well, he did from Vine Mon at uh, Battleground would have been north and then was going to cut over east to go to Georgia. But instead, whatever happened and then the car ended up going the opposite direction with him or not with him. We don't know. Wow. Yeah. I'm getting geography lessons, too. Yeah, I know. And I'm telling you, I'm not good at geography, so this is really great. <laughs> so, so far, I haven't been able to uncover in any publicly available information why his family may have thought he had enemies. Um, his case had been classified as an endangered missing person case. And so I'm making an educated guess and say this is likely not only due to the circumstances with his car discovery um, but also because of what the family said. But also in addition, one little tidbit that I did pick up is that prior to his disappearance, and we aren't sure how far before his disappearance, he actually did have a heart attack as well. So they may have done that partly for his health. Oh, like a medical sure, but, thing. Mm-hmm. I think in danger can encompass a few different things. So, And, you know, if he had a heart attack while he was on the road, it doesn't make it okay for somebody to just take his car. Yeah, yeah. Why didn't somebody call I mean, I really... I mean, that's an assumption and just, you know, thinking out loud, but... I kind of wonder, though, if that were the case, and it very well could have been, maybe he had a heart attack and they were afraid and hit him, but you almost think they would have, if he was back in the forest like that, they would have just left him in the car. I don't know. Yeah. It, why take the car so far away? But why not just leave him in the car? If it was completely yeah. an accident, you had nothing to do with yeah. it, just leave him in the car. Call for help. I know. If, I, there, <laughs> why don't you just call for help? Or, you know, a lot of times some people will just drop people off at a hospital. They don't stay. They just drop them off at the That's hospital. That's true. Yep. So, again, yeah, all conjecture. We have no idea what actually happened i wish i um had like the information like whether it was the store clerk or who was the one that saw him you know that reported seeing him at the jet pet i we don't even know if he stopped for gas or if he just stopped there you know to get something at the store or whether anybody was with him or yeah that's true or whether anybody was with him They, they could have been out in the car and nobody even knew yeah so often as we've had the case B, we've been waiting for a call back from the Coleman County Sheriff's Office. Um, haven't heard from them yet. At this point, we've shared all the public information that we have on this case. But as always, if we get any new developments, we will let you know of any of those updates. His mother, Elizabeth, said in a 2013 ABC article I just hope everything will work out and somebody will help us. The article continues to summarize that the case had gone cold and the detectives hope that the public will help provide the missing link so his family can have closure. His mother passed away sadly in 2021, so she won't be here to learn what happened to her son. That's sad. I know. It seems like that seems to be the case in so many of our, you know. It does. And Going back to what we said earlier about the not just leaving them in the car, like there's other routes that you could take. Mm -hmm. But if you are just absolutely determined that you're not going to call for help and you're not going to drop somebody off at the hospital in any shape or form, get them aid, at least leave them where their family can find them. Uh, This, yeah whole hiding these stories make me so sad and they make me so angry 
when parents pass away or even children pass away and they have no idea what happened. Exactly. I, yeah, this always gets me. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter what the case, it always makes me upset to hear that the family just never could find out before they passed. At the time of his disappearance, David Michael Burney was very roughly about 5'4 to 5'7 in height, 155 to 165 pounds with graying and balding brown hair and mostly a gray horseshoe style mustache. He had many tattoos on his arm, a scar on his right arm, and a brown birthmark on the front of his neck right underneath his chin. He was also missing several or possibly all of his teeth. So we ask you to please come forward if you or anyone you know has any information, including, but of course not limited to, any of the following odd events leading up to the days before his disappearance, his whereabouts on or after June 29th, 2007, and sightings or knowledge about his red uh, 1987 Toyota Tercel. It being red, it might have been easy to remember, and particularly if you found that memory coming from like the battleground area or the Bankhead National Forest in Winston County. So we're actually not going to be moving too far down the road for our next discussion. 27-year-old Tabitha Lynn Franklin was last seen in Vinemont, Alabama on August 13, 2009, just a month and two days before her 28th birthday. She was believed to be wearing a black medium-length dress, and the last person reported to have seen Tabitha was an ex-boyfriend named Chris Poor. It does not appear Chris has ever been named in media articles, but we were able to speak with members of Tabitha's family who confirmed Chris is the last person who saw Tabitha. At the time of her disappearance, Tabitha was described as approximately 5'7 and 140 pounds, with medium-length blonde hair and blue eyes. She had a C-section scar on her abdomen, a small scar on her nose, a mole on her right cheek, and both ears were pierced. She had multiple tattoos, an angel on her right arm, a rose on her right ankle, a scroll on her left arm, and a butterfly on her back between her shoulders. One thing I noticed when researching her case is that Namus and Aaliyah have her listed as Tabitha Leanne Franklin in their databases, but all of the flyers and media reports have her name as Tabitha Lynn Franklin. Court records we've reviewed also indicate her legal name is Tabitha Lynn Franklin, so I don't know where Leanne came from. Sounds like it might have been like a handwriting thing, maybe, that somebody misunderstood something that was written, you know, not typed. Maybe. Sometimes when I write things really fast, I can't read my own writing. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> so I can see where the two ends yeah. would kind of run together. Maybe they just got confused with the Y. Could be. That's kind of something important. Yeah, I would say so. It would be nice to see that updated. It appears that Tabitha married a man named Brian Franklin, although it's not really clear when that occurred. Tabitha and Brian had three children, Dawson, Hannah, and Gavin. At the time of Tabitha's disappearance, Dawson was 10, Hannah was 8, and Gavin was 6. Based on court records, it appears that Brian and Tabitha separated around the 2000 time frame. While the court records are publicly available documents, we're not going to get into the content at this time. However, we will say, based on what we've read, it doesn't appear that Brian and Tabitha's relationship was always amicable. That happens, I think, with divorces, separation. I think that's pretty status quo, I guess I could say. Yeah, if you think about it, there's a reason that you're not together anymore. So you kind of expect that. At some point prior to her disappearance, Tabitha began seeing Chris. According to a 2013 Bog Talk Radio interview by Tabitha's sister-in-law, Stacy, Chris was physically abusive to Tabitha. Pretty frequently, it seems like. On several of the Facebook pages dedicated to finding Tabitha, there's a photo of Tabitha with what appears to be severe bruising under both of her eyes. That picture was horrible. I just felt so, (laughs) they just looked horrible. 
almost raccoon like they were so bad. I know. And when it popped up in a Google search, when I just initially searched her name for information. Mm-hmm. And at first I thought, did someone Photoshop that? Oh, yeah. And why would they do that? But then when it popped up on the pages that were ran by her family, I realized, no, that actually is her. And that is scary. Mm -hmm. Her eyes were even, like her actual eyes were even swollen in the picture, not just her around it. And I can't imagine knowing that that's, the person responsible for that is also the last person she was known to be with. I agree. According to Stacy's interview, that photo was taken after a disturbing incident that occurred while Tabitha and Chris were in Michigan. I think they'd traveled there to see family members. Mm-hmm. Stacy stated the beating Tabitha had received had been so severe she passed out. And when Tabitha woke up, she actually drove straight back to Coleman County to file a report, and the photo was taken as evidence of what had occurred. That explains the picture, then. Yes, and she filed charges, but those charges were later dropped after threats were made to Tabitha's family. And we did some searching on Chris's background, and he has a pretty extensive criminal record. In Michigan, Alabama, Tennessee, and currently Illinois, which we'll get into in a little bit. It's uh, not a far stretch to think that at least... It's reasonable that the family and maybe even law enforcement, if they do, suspect that he might be involved. At a minimum, this wasn't a one-off right. thing. Right. Yep. Tabitha was last seen waiting for a ride outside a residence located at 1140 County Road 136 in Vinemont. Her family stated she had been living at the residence with Keith Floyd at the time of her disappearance. In that same blog talk radio interview, Stacy said Tabitha spoke to her mother the night of her disappearance, and based on the content of that conversation, I'm going to assume it was after Chris picked her up. Hmm. Stacy said Tabitha told her mother what was going on and that she knew Chris was going to kill her because he had threatened her children if she didn't get in the car. That's that's kind of common too, I think, for um, you know, for domestic violence situations where. They're so afraid that they end up just staying and often to protect their family or sometimes themselves. But Can you imagine being a mom and getting that phone call? Mm -hmm. I would probably flip out if it was one of my kids. Oh, it just made my heart like start pounding even hearing her say that. Chris did admit to law enforcement that he picked Tabitha up, though what happened after he picked her up is a little bit hazy. He claims that he dropped her off at his place of business in Hueytown while he ran errands and that she was gone when he returned. But there are reports that claim she never made it to Hueytown. Just as a side note, Hueytown is in Jefferson County and about an hour away from the Vinemont address. And in that same interview that we were just talking about, Stacy said this happened at night and that this would have been late night that he was running errands, so that seemed strange to her that he would be running errands at this time. There hasn't been a specific time pinpointed other than just to say that it was night. Hmm. That is kind of strange. You kind of, you think going to work and you think early or in the day. I think it was just weird that he dropped her off there anyway. It is kind of weird. It seems like there was some discrepancy to begin with about whether Coleman County or Jefferson County should handle the investigation, kind of like what happened in Brittany Wood's case between Mobile Police Department and Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, where the last time you know she was seen was in Coleman County, but then you have someone claiming they took her to another county. So it was kind of like, okay, she was seen in Coleman County, but as far as we know, she left our jurisdiction and went into another one. That happens quite frequently, I think. Um, You know, we we have, especially I think in missing, because there's no, um, often there's no definite sightings. So there's a lot of hearsay as to where they went. And, you know, Hueytown is not far from Birmingham. 
Jefferson County is the largest county in Alabama. And Birmingham is massive. And Hueytown's really not that far outside of Birmingham. So this is one of the more populated areas. I haven't looked to see exactly what Hueytown specifically their population is. But you would think this isn't some rural county like what we've been talking about. You know, we just talked about that Coleman County's in the double digit thousands versus some of the smaller counties that we've been talking about that are in the single digit thousands. Right. So you would expect that there would be traffic cameras or things like that by the 2009 time frame. Yeah, you would think. So did they try to check these areas? That's really not that clear. And you would almost think that maybe not since there was kind of that back and forth a little bit on who was actually going to handle the investigation. Yeah, that would make sense that there might be some confusion on who is actually looking for those items. Investigators did question Chris once in the beginning, but he retained a lawyer after that and hasn't been questioned again, at least to our knowledge. In November of 2009, Chris was evicted from the building that he'd been operating his business out of. Tabitha's family contacted the landlord to the building and requested permission to search it, which the landlord agreed to. That marked the first time that building had been searched in connection to Tabitha's disappearance. But what evidence... You would think that would have been one of the first places searched. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he even, you know, said that's where he took her. So you would think they would at least go to, you know, a, a location that somebody said she was at. And, but going back to that dispute thing, Jefferson County, I think, said, well, we don't have any proof that she was here. But you have the person that picked her up saying that. Isn't that proof? I mean, that's somewhere to start in an investigation. You don't just ignore I what mean, people say. Yeah, it's not necessarily proof. But um, at that point, you kind of have to take what the last person who saw her says as at face value. Right. I mean... If I told somebody I brought my mom to the grocery store the other day until they go and ask the clerk, they're not going to (laughs) know. Right. What evidence or information was found as a result of that search, if any, is unknown at this time. Hmm. If he'd been evicted, I think he was also doing some maybe renovations around that time, possibly based on some of the things that Stacy said in the blog talk radio interview. But You know, this is also a little while later, so who knows what would have been in there. Right. And any video could have already been taped over at that point. You know, videos aren't, they don't just stay indefinitely. A lot of surveillance videos, they roll over after a certain time period or they're just gone. There's an expiration date on those. They don't always just go to the cloud. That's a more recent thing. About three months after Tabitha's disappearance, her cousin Sherry contacted Chris after receiving information that Chris still had some of Tabitha's clothes in his possession. She actually recorded that conversation, and it can be heard on that same blog talk episode, which we'll link in the episode details. Well, that was smart thinking. It was. I guess when Sherry called Chris, her number showed up as an unknown number. He answered either way. But he asked her why her number was blocked. And she told him that it just automatically does that whenever she makes calls. And he makes a comment like, don't hide your number or something when you call me next time. I'm like, sorry, Charlie. <laughs> I know. If she And she offers, she said, oh, well, I can give you my number and you can call me back if you want to. Um, to try to like smooth that over. To let him know she wasn't trying to do anything shady. She wasn't intentionally hiding her number from him. Mm -hmm. In that conversation, Chris admits to Sherry that he does have some of Tabitha's clothes and photos. And that he will get them to a mutual or neutral party. The audio isn't very clear, so it's a little bit hard to make out what he's saying. Sherry tells him that she'll be in Birmingham in about a week's time if he wants to just meet up with her. But he again says he'll get them to somebody else. And so she clarifies with him again and confirms that he'll get them to a 
mutual or neutral party because it sounds like she wasn't really sure what he said either. And he says yes. However, Chris ultimately ended up leaving the state without ever returning any of those items. Well, I wonder where they all ended up. You know, the landlord cleaned everything out or? Well, he was living at that Mulga Loop Road address, so it could have possibly been at his house. I guess so, yeah. The family has continued searching nearby areas for signs of Tabitha since her disappearance, including Smith Lake, which led to a 2011 search of the lake by divers and search teams. According to Angie Cantrell of Walker County Search and Rescue, locals began noticing clothing showing up at the lake around the time Tabitha disappeared. And it wasn't clothing you might expect to find at a lake. I know you think sometimes things fall out of bags yeah. and they might get left behind. Right. Um, so that finding an occasional item of clothing wouldn't seem odd, but they said this was more like a stream of clothing. That's really um, odd. Angie Cantrell told ABC 3340, You might find a bikini where someone was partying a little too hard, but this is more of a wardrobe. This is somebody's dresser drawer full of clothes. All the right size, all the same size. Well, wow. So is that where they came from? I'm not sure. I'd, it's never been confirmed whether the clothing belonged to Tabitha that's something that we're hoping that maybe her family can confirm for us. Um, and if it if they can, we'll do an update. That may also be something that if it is known, it's not publicly known because that's something that investigators don't want publicly known. It could be, yeah. In 2014, deputies received new information related to the Vinemont property where Tabitha was last seen. Mike Rainey, the Coleman County Sheriff at the time, told the Coleman Times that cadaver dogs and ground-penetrating radar findings indicated there was a likelihood of evidence under the porch. As a result, crews completely excavated the cement slab of the front porch. It was a pretty large piece of cement. There's actually a photo of it. That's crazy. I think I remember seeing that picture. It almost, I hate to say it, but it almost looked like the size of a body itself. I know. It, I guess it was just a, a solid piece. They had like jackhammers and all kind of things out there. So I guess they were just taking the chunks as they could off the property. But I don't know where they took it once they removed it. It says they removed it from the site, but it doesn't say where they took it from the property. Unfortunately, once that occurred, it didn't appear the ground underneath the front porch had been disturbed and no further information was obtained through their search. Well, that's crazy. I mean, did they? there's no report of whether the cement was tested either? Not that I've seen anywhere. That's just weird to me that they would have dogs, you know, alert and then nothing. And not just dogs, but also the ground penetrating radar. Oh, right, right. That seems like a lot of indicators for there to be nothing. Mm-hmm. Keith Floyd and Christina Moore, however, were arrested on unrelated drug charges. Sheriff Rainey stated that neither Floyd nor Moore were officially tied to the investigation into Franklin's disappearance. That's some pretty specific wording, huh? That is really specific. So yeah. officially, they like they emphasize that. Maybe because her family had already said that Tabitha was living with Keith at that address at the time of her disappearance, and that's why they weren't officially tied. I don't know whether Christina Moore was living there at the time, but again, that's a pretty specific word to use. Yeah. And you would think that when law enforcement makes a statement, they choose their words intentionally. I was just going to say they're very specific, as you were saying. There's usually a reason for every word they say when it's something to do with an investigation like this. At least you would like to think that they're intentional in their wording. It seems like there may have been more than just two people living in the home at the time of the excavation, because an article from WBRC commented that the people who lived at the home were not considered suspects, but two of the residents were arrested. Sheriff Rainey also stated that Tabitha's case was still considered a missing person case, but investigators had changed their view on what occurred based on information received over the years and now believed that foul play was likely involved. Oh, now they believe foul play was involved. 
So nothing before then indicated to them that foul play was involved. And I'm not really sure how. When you have family members that have expressed concerns about physical abuse that occurred in the past, the person that was last seen with her has now obtained a lawyer and left the state at this point. Yeah. That seems like that probably would have changed well before that point. Yeah, you would think. Then on May 28, 2016, with the assistance of cadaver dogs and a special crime scene unit from Madison County Sheriff's Office, Coleman County began searching a home on Mulga Loop Road for Tabitha based off a tip they received. We can't confirm the address of the property searched on Mulga Loop Road, but we did find court records indicating that Chris lived on Mulga Loop Road, and Tabitha's family stated that she also lived with Chris there. So just hazarding a guess here that the search was performed at the property Chris lived at. Sounds like it. I mean, that's a pretty reasonable assumption. As we said earlier, we've emailed and attempted to call the Coleman County Sheriff's Office to verify, but so far, we've not received a response. Unfortunately, that search also yielded no new information. In August of 2016, current Coleman County Sheriff Matt Gentry said 14 searches had been conducted over the past year over multiple counties with the assistance of multiple agencies. Those counties included Coleman, Walker, and Winston counties. In a statement to the Coleman Times, Sheriff Gentry said, Missing person cases are very important to us because they are very heart-wrenching for the families who are searching for answers to their loved ones. Our investigators work nonstop to uncover new leads in the hope that the next lead might be the one that brings peace to the family. Those seem like some pretty serious words. What a family wants to hear at the time. It is a nice sentiment, and Tabitha's family fully supported Sheriff Gentry in his run for sheriff. Yeah. The owner of the property searched on Mogul Loop Road was not involved in Tabitha's disappearance. They did make that clear. Later in November of 2016, Coleman County Sheriff's Office traveled to Illinois to question several people related to Tabitha's disappearance. Sheriff Gentry said the interviews were to follow up on information related to a person of interest in the case. He stated the person was questioned in 2009, but fled the area after questioning. Well, that sounds like somebody we know. I know. Hmm. It was reported that Winnebago County Sheriff's Office was working with Coleman County investigators on the case. We can't say with any certainty whether the person Sheriff Gentry was referring to was Chris Poor, but we can say that in October of 2016, Chris was arrested in Illinois by Winnebago County Sheriff's deputies after he broke into a home and brutally attacked a 17-year-old girl. At the time of his arrest, investigators believed he may have also tried to abduct two young girls from McKesney Park. That is just crazy. I mean... After everything else, and I know I'm interrupting you, but after everything else that they already knew, and then this, and we still don't know if he's a suspect. I know, and he, that goes back to it wasn't just a one-off situation with that instance where they reported the abuse for Tabitha. Wow. This is obviously something that has occurred on several occasions. I don't know whether he was ever... It was ever found that he did try to abduct those two young girls. But Chris remains incarcerated in the Southwestern Correctional Center in southwestern Illinois on those charges of home invasion and assault. That's something he was found guilty on that. So that obviously was proven. Hmm. His current projected parole date is March 20th, 2024, and his projected discharge date is March 20th, 2027. In listening to the Blog Talk Radio interview, it sounds like Tabitha had struggled with drug addiction in the years prior to her disappearance, and that her family feels like that may have been part of why her case hasn't always received the same amount of attention that other cases have. And we hear that a lot, unfortunately. Yeah, we do. That's something that we talk about regularly, actually, that a lot of the cases that we discuss seem to have... Some common ground. Not every case, but a lot of them do. They do. I mean, I can think of, you know, well, like Brianna Reyes. You know, she didn't have a lot of attention on hers, and she had a history. 
That's true. That's true. Another thing I heard, though, was that Tabitha was a dedicated mother who maintained regular contact with her children and loved them dearly. Her children were very young when this happened, but they're grown now, and they've sort of taken on the responsibility of advocating for their mother. Not that it's needed, but it should be a reminder that no matter the circumstances, the people we discuss in our episodes are real people with real lives and a family that loves them and misses them. And they matter. That is such a great sentiment. A lot of people lose sight of that. They think if people, you know, maybe haven't made the best choices in the world, that maybe they don't deserve quite as much attention as some of the others. But they are, you know, in the end, they're a mother, a father, a son, a daughter. Definitely they matter. It's just the empty feeling of not knowing where your mom is and not knowing what happened to her. I, I don't think they're really doing anything anymore. I I kind of think they just threw it in the side, and it's a cold case now, and it's just in the past. Every now and again, I just try to get her out there and let people know that, you know, we're still worried about her. We still care about her, and we want to know where she's at. And this certain story is, I don't know, it's just kind of blown up pretty big. And a lot of those stories are getting ignored. I feel amazing for the people who are getting attention because they're lucky to get it. A lot of people don't. More people don't get it than people do. Tabitha's family, especially her children, continue searching for her today. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Tabitha Franklin or David Burney, please contact the Coleman County Sheriff's Office at 256-734-0342 or through their secret witness number at 256-734-0210. And you may also submit tips through Crime Stoppers Metro Alabama, and we'll provide that information in the episode description. Since Alabama Cold Case Advocacy's creation, we have dedicated innumerable hours to researching and networking in an effort to provide the largest platform we can to the cases we share. We shoulder all associated expenses with Alabama Cold Case Advocacy out of our own pocket, including the subscription fees for researching and production of the Unforgotten podcast to provide a cost-free avenue for the victims' families of those cases. We hope you will join in our efforts to raise awareness of Alabama's missing and murdered and support these families who have been forced to carry the immeasurable loss of their loved ones and the fight for answers. If you appreciate our mission and you are inspired to make a donation, your extra support will enable the ACCA to continue our research, share the cold cases, and help those families know that they are also unforgotten. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Anchor FM, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy, artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening to Unforgotten.